I'm so excited that you are here. We're in the third week of the series we're calling Emoji. If this happens to be your first time here, allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Brad. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at 242. And, uh, and putting this series together for me uh, was this a labor of, of, of fun, actually, because um, this series kind of came out of just a, a, it's a unique season in my personal life. Because uh, here's the thing, I wasn't raised going to church, I mentioned this before, and it was about the exact same season that I started going to church, like the end of my high school career, it was during that exact same season that I got my first cell phone. Do you remember your first cell phone? Think about it, like, I remember, mine was the Nokia brick, right? Like, it didn't have a name, they didn't name phones back then, but it's, essentially it was what it was, the Nokia brick, like literally indestructible, all right? Drop it, throw it off a wall, you can't break the thing. Nuclear fallout happens, all that's left is cockroaches and Nokia phones, right? <laughs> and I remember I got this phone, and it, I mean, it changed my life. I mean, this, this, for the first time, I'm, I'm calling people wherever I want, you know? And I remember I had to watch my minutes. I had to watch my minutes, remember that, you know? And roaming charges, like, whoa, you know? And learning how to use this phone. And, uh, and I'll never forget, it was probably like a year, maybe, maybe two years into having this phone, that my phone made a noise I've never heard before. And I looked down at that green screen and there were words. And I got my first text message. Do you remember your first text message? I got that, I was like, how rude. <laughs> Let me think, remember, because remember sending text messages, that used to be, that you, when you sent a text message, you were committing the person on the other end of that phone for like a five minute response. It was like two, 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 nine, 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 eight, 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 four, four, six. Ah, oh, backspace, 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 right? <laughs> like texting was the worst thing ever. And it's just, it's just so amazing. As you watch now, like, so you have an indestructible phone where texting is impossible. And now we've like, you know, progressed to the point where now if you breathe on your phone wrong, it breaks. And when people call you now, you're like, rude? Why are you calling me, bounce? You know, like, just text it, dude, you know? And we primarily communicate through text. There's so many of us. We don't want to call people. We don't want to pick up our phone when people call. We screen all of our calls. We want to text. And as we text, what's interesting to me is just because I love preaching, I love communication, is just watching the English language devolve as we text, right? It used to be, what is up? Then it's, what's up? Now it's, sup. You know, like it just... <laughs> and we're literally devolving back to hieroglyphics, right? And that's what emojis kind of are. Like, I'll be honest with you, I'm, to, I'm just being vulnerable, I'm to the point where if you don't put an emoji with your text message, I don't really know how to read it, okay? <laughs> it can be like, hey Brad, how you doing? I'm like, uh, there's no smiley face, are they mad at me? What did I do, did I offend them some way? Like, like we are so good at reading emojis now. Like, in fact, let's do this together. Um, on the screen behind me, uh, I'm gonna put up uh, some pictograms of some movies and see if you could guess the movie, okay? So it's, it's not phonetic, so don't sound out the emojis, but like, from the pictures, can you guess what movie it is? And, and I know we're in church, but just be loud, scream it out if you know it, okay? Uh, here's the first one. What movie is that? <laughs> Woo, you guys are fast. That is Silence of the Lamb, which is rated R. So now I know where all the sinners are in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Only Passion of the Christ, people. Um, <laughs> how about this one? Ah, yeah, Polar Express. There you go. That was good. That was, that was more difficult. All right. All right, taking it up a notch. Here we go. It's like you all share one mind. Like, not any music. All right. All right, I got one more. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. All right, here we go. What? Back to the future. There you go. Isn't that amazing? You're reading emojis, people. Words are not even necessary anymore, right? It's Tower of Babel. We're just looking at emojis now, okay? Um, but here's where the series came, through, came from, okay? Uh, we're not preaching about emojis. We're, we're preaching about one book of the Bible, all right? This whole series, we're going through this entire book of the Bible. It's a book called Philippians. And the third week of the series, we're in the third chapter. So if you have your Bible with you, your Bible app, you can open it up to Philippians chapter three. And, and that's what we're going to be reading uh, for our time today. But, but where this idea of emoji came from is this. This book was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul who wrote over half the New Testament, Paul who started all these churches around the Mediterranean Sea, and, and Paul's writing the, this letter back to one of the churches that he started, okay? 
It's in a town called Philippi. That's why the book's called Philippians. He's writing this letter to them. And what's interesting is that in four short chapters, Paul stamps emojis all over the pages. In four short chapters, Paul is going to use the word joy 16 times. Some iteration of the word joy in four chapters, he does it 16 times. Because it's like, it's almost as if he's saying like, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm saying this, but I'm not mad at you. I, I'm, I'm correcting you, but I'm not mad at you. Like, I'm, I'm, I want the best for you. I'm, this is not out of anger. This is because of joy I have for you. This is, for, this is because of the joy I want you to experience. And as you go through these chapters, 16 times, you'll see this word joy. But in particular, in this chapter, Paul does have to do some correcting. And, and, and he wants people to know what the motive is, what the emotion is behind this correction. And so when you read the first verse, you see it right there. Jump off the page. Let's read this together. We'll put it on the screen here for you. It says this. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. And it is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again. And it is a safeguard for you. Paul's saying here, first and foremost, I'm writing you this chapter. Here's what I'm, here's what I'm, what I'm getting at. Is I want you to rejoice in the Lord. Find your joy in the Lord. And now that Greek word, you know, joy there, it has this connotation of like having hope, putting your hope in the Lord. You see, in, in our context, in our language, the word hope is kind of equated with wishing, right? I hope I win the lottery. You know, like that's the way we think about hope. But in the Hebrew mindset, the word hope is more in line with the word trust. Hope in the Lord, trust in the Lord. And Paul's coming right out of the gate because he, he, here's the thing, he's, he started this church he, and, he, and he left it and he heard that this church is not putting its hope in the Lord anymore. He heard that this church is doing something that's not honoring to God, it's doing something that it was never meant to do and so he's writing this letter to correct this church specifically in Philippi. But as I read this letter and as I read these pages, I think some of this still applies to us today. Not that we're doing the same thing but but we're doing something similar. In fact, what the church back then was doing was really specific. What Paul is trying to correct them of is a very specific thing. In fact, you see it in verse two. It's, it's not on the screen, but I'll read it to you. Paul tells them, hey, you need to watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. And what is happening is this. Back then, for centuries, if you wanted to be a, one of the followers of God, there's only two people in the world, people who followed God and people who didn't. And if you wanted to be one of the followers of God, one of the nation of Israel, on the eighth day you were born, you had to be circumcised. And that was the only way you could be a follower of God is if, if you were physically circumcised. And so what happened was, Paul started this church in Philippi, which is in modern day Greece, where they don't circumcise children, never had circumcised children. And, and, and this, Paul leaves this church, and this church starts preaching about Jesus. It starts preaching about grace. It starts preaching about the gospel. And people are like, I want that. So people are like, what do I do to say yes to Jesus? And the people of the church were like, you just need to get circumcised. <laughs> yeah, it didn't grow that fast. The church wasn't growing that, that fast. Paul hears about this. He's like, whoa, 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 what? He hears about what they're doing, and he writes them. He says, no, no, rejoice in the Lord. Focus on the Lord. Put your hope in the Lord, and you beware of anyone who tells you that you need to be circumcised. Those dogs, those mutilators of the flesh, do not listen to them. Man, could you imagine being the last guy that got a circumcision before this letter arrived? <laughs> You're just sitting on some frozen matzah like, What? can't freeze matzo. What am I talking about? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but he's correcting him. He's like, don't do this. Stop doing this. Because when you're, because the problem is this. What you're doing is you're putting your confidence literally in your flesh. You're putting your confidence and your, your confidence in your accomplishments. In fact, he's going to go on to say this. Look at verse three and four. It says this. For it is we who are the circumcision. We who serve God by the spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. He says, circumcision doesn't matter anymore. That's not what it is. It's when you serve God. It's we who live for God. It's we who rejoice in the Lord. Then we are living by the Spirit. Then we are being the church that God wants us to be. Then we are doing what God wants us to do. And I love it. He ends that section and he says, don't put confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason. And he's gonna list, for those of you who are tempted 
to put your confidence and your, your confidence and your accomplishments and your confidence in your flesh? He says this, don't do it. Look at the second half of verse four. He says, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. When it comes to, when it comes to being circumcised, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Of the, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regards to the law, I was a Pharisee. As far for zeal, I was persecuting the church. As far as righteousness, uh, righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. Paul's saying, whatever your parameters is, I was perfect in those. Now for you and me, that list, we might get lost now. That's a very impressive list for them back then. I mean, to be circumcised the right way, to be of the tribe of Benjamin, which Benjamin is the only son of Israel that was born in the promised land, to be a Pharisee, which there's only 300 religious leaders who were Pharisees, he's one of them. And as when it comes to following the law, faultless. Like that's, that's a good resume. I mean, today it may be like, you know, Paul would be like, hey, you stop putting your confidence in the flesh because I, I, I was perfect, okay? When it came to wealth, I was like Bill Gates. When it came to athletic, I was LeBron. When it came to looks, I was Ryan Gosling. When it came to humor, I was Brad Tate. Like he was just like saying, <laughs> like he's, he's laying out his resume, like I have done it all. And he's like, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that's not where it's at. And look what he, he gets down to, he boils down to. Verse seven and eight says this, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, and look at this line, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Paul's saying this, don't think that you can earn your way to a good life. Don't think that, that what you do is the, where the hope lies. Don't think in the, I've been perfect in every way. And I'm telling you, it's garbage. The King James Version says it's a rubbish life. The Greek, that word that Paul actually uses is skubala. Skubala. Can you say that word? Yeah. That's a rated R word. And you just said it in church. Now I know where the rest of the sinners are. No, Skubala, it's, it's, it's a vulgar word. It's a rated R word. It's a bumper sticker word. In the back of chariots, it would say, Skubala happens. <laughs> That's the word. That's how serious Paul is about this, though. He's saying... This church that I started, this church that knew Jesus, this church that's living for the Lord, you forgot to rejoice in the Lord. You forgot to put your hope in your Lord. Now you're putting your hope in traditions. You're putting your hope in your perfection. You're putting your hope in, in you following the law, following the rules. You're putting your hope in everything else other than God. And it's leading you down a path of a life that is rubbish. In fact, those verses that we just read, verses three to to all the way up to eight, you, you see Paul is laying out what a rubbish life is. He says when you live a rubbish life, it's gonna be a life that leads to disappointment. You're constantly gonna be disappointed because you're never gonna be able to be perfect. You're, it's a life that's gonna always be externally focused. When you're living a rubbish life, it's gonna always be about your house and it's gonna be about your car, it's gonna be about your clothes, it's gonna be about you looking like you have it all together when inside you are literally freaking out. It's always gonna be externally focused because you're gonna be afraid to show people your weaknesses. And when you're living a rubbish life, it's gonna be exhausting. It's gonna be exhausting. In fact, you're gonna fail. And here's the thing, when you're living the rubbish life, but you're telling people that you're living for the Lord, you're not only lying to yourself, you're tarnishing the name of Jesus. What Jesus did on that cross to bring you grace, what Jesus did on that cross to bring you salvation, what Jesus did on that cross to make your life, life to the full, when we rejoice in something else, and now, it not only leads us to a life that's exhausting and unfulfilling, but it's tarnishing the name of Jesus in this world. To where so many people say, well, I don't wanna to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. What if we weren't hypocrites? What if we were just all sinners in need of a savior? What if we were all just human beings going through this life 
who struggle and who are weak, but we have a Lord who is with us. That is how we're supposed to live. That is the life we're supposed to go into. And, and, and when we put our hope in these other things, we're living this rubbish life and we're misrepresenting who God is. And I think it matters to God. That's why Paul's writing this to this church centuries ago, but I still think it applies to our church today that Paul is calling his church to wake up and rejoice in the Lord. Put your hope in the Lord. The second half of this section, he, he shows you what a real life is. He shows you what it really looks like. I mean, go back to verse eight. Paul says, what is more, I consider everything lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them, skubala, so that I may gain Christ. Paul says, I throw all that stuff away. All that stuff is rubbish. You know why I throw it away? Because I get to gain Christ. The real life is a relational life. The way that we are to interact with our heavenly father is no longer about the rules. It's about having a relationship with him. We're no longer, you know, the, 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 the desire of God is no longer that, that we have to keep all 600 and some of these laws. The, the purpose of the law was never even to be righteous. The purpose of the law was to show you that you're not. And what he's saying is, it's not about the rules anymore. Now it's about the relationship. And a real life is living in a relationship with God. Look at verse nine, it says this. It says that we could gain Christ and, and, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of our own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. It's no longer about you being perfect. It's no longer about your righteousness. That, you are declared righteous not by what you do, but because of who Jesus is. And can I just tell you, Living in that grace, walking in that, with that faith, that is relaxing. That is relaxing. The real life is a relaxing life because I can stand up here and I don't have to be perfect and I don't have to be strong and I don't have to be smart. I just have to be submitted to God and he'll use me for his glory and when I mess up, his grace will cover me. Are you living in that? Or is your hope in something else? And then finally what you see, it ends up this section, look at verse 10. Paul's telling this church, he says this, and I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And that's what it boils down to. When we're living the real life, you're tapping into the power of the resurrection of Jesus. I love it when it says, when you're, when you're living the real life, you can even participate in Christ's suffering. I love that because here's the thing, nobody gets out of this world clean, right? We, we all have, have sin that surrounds us, we have brokenness that surrounds us, we have heartache that surrounds us. And every one of us, we go through seasons of suffering. But when we're living through with Christ, when we're rejoicing in the Lord, the way we participate in that suffering is different. It's just different. There's a woman who goes to 242, and oh, she is a saint of a woman. But her body is failing her. She is in and out of the hospital. It seems like every few weeks she calls me, Brad, I'm back in again. Doctors are saying this, and they're telling me that, but I'm telling them about Jesus. And she says, Brad, would you pray? I'm, yeah, I'll pray, and we pray. And I'm telling you, she is suffering in her body, but she is ministering to those doctors and nurses' souls. And they are witnessing a power that most people who are going through what she's going through does not have. And it's because her hope is not in her body. Her hope is in the Lord. Paul is writing this letter as a wake-up call to the church. He says, when you put your hope in anything else, it's gonna be on this shaky ground. Because whatever you're tempted to put your hope in, if it's your health, your relationships, your family, if it's your wealth, all of that can be taken away from you. And what happens is we all then live in fear and anxiety because what happens if I lose my job? What happens if I get a diagnosis? What happens? And we live with this anxiety in our life and God says, no, 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 no. You were meant to live with power. 
You're meant to live that whatever this, in a way that whatever this world throws at you, you know that I have you. You know that you, you have me. You know that your salvation is secure. That is the way that you are to live, to walk through this world. And what you need to wake up to is realize that at some point, your commitment to me means everything else in comparison has to be rubbish. Now here's my question for us today. Is that how you're living? Is that how you're living? That you could honestly say everything else in my life compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus is skubala? Or are you living for something else? Because it's so easy. We're so tempted. It's all around us, right? Skubala. <laughs> Maybe some of you, this is what you live for. I live for my car. I spend more time literally washing my car than I do reading God's word. Some of you spend more money on your car than you do for the kingdom of God. Is that how you're living? Or are you willing to say in comparison, it's trash. And I know some of you have seen my car, and you're like, you should have thrown those away a long time ago. Here's it. <laughs> my wife's car keys are on that ring too, okay? That's, illustration still holds. But seriously, I mean, like, what are you living for? Accomplishments, raises, ego, is that what we're living for? Can you say it's trash compared to knowing God? For a lot of us, it's right here, right? Think about what you keep in your wallet, your ID and your wealth. And a lot of us, this is our deity, this is our hope. And what Paul's saying, you need to wake up and realize it's scupala. It's my college degree. It surprises me how many of you have never asked to see this. <laughs> just show up each week just trusting I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I was the first person in my family to graduate college. No, that's not the point, that's not, that's, not the, that's not the desire. Like those are all good things, but it's skubala if I'm not submitted to Christ, if I'm not living for Christ, if I'm not using that for Christ, then it's worthless. That's the level of commitment that God is looking for. That's the, that's the journey that we should all be on. When we say at 242 we wanna help people take next steps with God, believe me, we're the first person in line for fun and we want you to come here and feel welcome. We want you to come here and feel safe. We want you to come here and feel like you can ask questions if you don't understand it, but we also want you to come here and get closer to Jesus and start living for Jesus because if we don't do that, then we're a failure. This is Outreach Magazine. It tracks the, the 100 largest churches in the country, and it tracks the largest, fastest, uh, it tracks the, tracks the fastest growing churches in the country. For the past four years, 242 has been one of the top 100 fastest growing churches in this country. One year we were number eight, one year we were number two. Now we're on the largest 100 churches in the country list. If all we accomplish is 6,000 people watching church services, then we failed. God doesn't need 6,000 people watching sermons and listening to sermons and watching worship. God just needs one more person to rejoice in him. Jesus took 12 unschooled, ordinary people who were willing to risk, who were willing to rejoice in him, and he changed the world. There's far more than 12 of us in this room. But how many are really ready to rejoice in the Lord? How many are really ready to put your hope in the Lord? And here's the thing, some of you did it. Some of you did it and, and, and you forgot because life just is a habit and you forgot. And you've gone back in. A friend of mine uh, was on a mission field in Nepal, North a country north and east of India. And they do some medical work there. They test for HIV, they test for hepatitis, and they, 
They do like blood work there. And, and when they get volunteers who want to help in their clinic, one of the volunteers' jobs, literally, is to watch the trash. They have to watch the trash. They have to look at it. They keep a, keep a watch over it because the children in the neighborhood, desperate for food, desperate for nourishment, they will go in and they'll pull out trash. But what they don't understand is that's death in there. That's literally dangerous. That's death in there. So someone has to get them away from it. So no, no, no. If you want life, let me give you food over here. And that's what Paul's saying. If you're not rejoicing in the Lord, then you're going to find out that the life you're living at some point, you're just going to become real. It's rubbish. But for those who are willing to say yes to Jesus and walk with Jesus, he's going to change your life. And what I love is Paul ends out this section and, and he encourages us that it's not about being perfect. Look what he says in verse 12 and 13. He says, not that I already have obtained all this or I've already arrived at the goal, but I do press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I forget what was behind and I strain towards what is ahead. That is the way we should be living, getting closer to God, not farther away, trying to rejoice more in him not living with Scubala.